Let me show you a few examples, and then we'll talk about the trial. So here's, this is pre, these are people who were actually before the trial. This is a guy who started in 2013. And you can see here in the green where is where he started. Very poor testing, for example, auditory delayed uh, memory here. This is a smart guy, but his auditory delayed memory was down here at about the 12th percentile or so. And you can see these dramatic improvements here um, after a couple of years on treatment. And uh, so he has done you know, particularly well and, and it, you know, has done, has gotten back. For example, one of the things that's, that happened with him is he was very good at adding uh, whole columns of numbers. He would meet with his accountants and say, oh yeah, this is about, oh yeah, about 430,000. Like, wow, you can really do that quickly. He lost that ability with his Alzheimer's. He got it back. And I should say, as far as his having Alzheimer's, he had PET scan proven uh, Alzheimer's. He had a copy of APOE4, single copy, uh, which is the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. So if you look at the whole country, about three quarters of us are APOE4 negative. So we have, so for example, I checked myself, I'm a 3-3, that's kind of the most common, but about 75 million Americans have a single copy of APOE4, which as I said, that's is the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean you're going to get it, but if you have zero copies, your lifetime risk somewhere around 9%. It's not zero, but it's not terribly high. If you have a single copy, as this man did, then you have, as man does, um, then you have about a 30% lifetime risk. And if you have two copies, it's well over 50%. It's more likely that you will develop Alzheimer's during your life than that you will avoid it. So this is a huge issue. And we recommend that everybody find out their status and get on appropriate prevention or early reversal. Again, the, the approach which has been backward over the years is, well, don't bother to find out because there's nothing you can do about it. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. Here's another example. So this is a woman who's actually now in her late 70s, who's done very well. You can see here dramatic improvements. And not only did she improve her cognition, but she improved her hippocampal volume and she also improved her PET scan results as well. Here's a third guy, 66 year old man came in. This is actually a, a very smart physician who came in a number of years ago. Um, family history, both of his parents had died with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this guy also had single copy of APOE4. He'd already been evaluated, had a markedly positive amyloid PET scan, had an FDG PET, which was uh, typical for Alzheimer's. So he had both the amyloid PET and the FDG PET were abnormal. His hippocampal volume was already reduced and his neuropsych testing showed that he was already well into MCI on his way to Alzheimer's disease. So you can see why, if you look here, he had a very, very high HSCRP. We like to see him less than 1.0, preferably even less than 0.5. This guy had one that was almost 10. So he had ongoing inflammation. Homocysteine, which should be seven or lower, his was 15. Vitamin D, we like to see it between 50 and 80. His was 21. His testosterone was low. His free T3 was low. His TSH was a bit too high. So all of these things. So he responded beautifully and this guy, as a physician question, you know, he had called me about whether that we were doing any clinical trials. And I said, well, we're not there yet, but if you come in, we're doing something that's helped a number of people. This was before publishing anything. And, you know, let's, let's talk. And so as I went through everything, he kept saying to me, you know, I don't believe this. I don't believe that this doesn't seem to be something that's going to help me on and on. So finally I said to the guy after about 20 minutes, I said, look, give me six months. If I can't make you better, then you go somewhere else. He said, there is no other place. I'm like, okay, well, give us a chance then to do, to uh, help you. And he did very, very well. And interestingly, you can see here from his, uh, both his metabolic profile and his, uh, and his MRI. So you can see his fasting insulin. It's still not perfect. We like to see him down at four or five, but it's so much better than it was at 32. His HSCRP, again, not perfect, but it's so much better than it was. His homocysteine, not quite perfect, but much better than it was. Vitamin D, better. So he did very, very well. And interestingly, his hippocampal volume actually increased. His gray matter increased here by 23%. So really striking results. We published these cases in, in these papers that I mentioned earlier, uh, published a couple of books on this as well. 
and these are now available in 32 languages, so you can get these anywhere. And so all of this led then to the trial that I'm that we've just finished that I mentioned earlier. And I'm really fortunate and honored to have worked with Dr. Anne Hathaway, Dr. Kat Toops, and Dr. Deborah Gordon, three outstanding functional medicine physicians. Uh, Anne is in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Uh, Kat is in the East Bay, and Deborah Gordon is in Oregon and Ashland. Um, all fantastic physicians who saw these 25 patients. And so this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first trial in which instead of predetermining a treatment, we actually went through, look, and this is registered with clinicaltrials.gov as all these clinical trials are. As I mentioned earlier, we were denied initially and then finally approved. The control group was denied, uh, but we were allowed to do this proof of uh, uh, principle. And now we'll go back with a with a bigger one here. And then was mentioned to 25. So we looked at people with MOCA scores of 18 and above. So this is out of 30. Um, typically when you're between 28 and 30, that's typically considered normal. If you drop below that for anywhere from about 22 to 26, and it depends again, 26, 27 depends on other factors as well. That's typically MCI. When you're down below 22, these are people who 18, 19, 20, this is all full on Alzheimer's disease. The average for all Alzheimer's patients, late, intermediate, and early is 16.2. So you can see these are people that we would be considered MCI or early Alzheimer's, not late Alzheimer's. We need to do a separate trial for the MOCAs of zero to 17 because it's likely we'll have to do additional things to improve them. Although to be fair, we've had a few people, uh, wonderful anecdotes of people with MOCA scores of zero who improved, but they don't come all the way back to normal. They improve, they can dress themselves again, they can speak again, they can get on the internet again, things like that, but they don't come all the way back to a MOCA of 30. On the other hand here, we had some patients who went from MOCA scores of 18, one of them with 18, one of them with 19, all the way back to perfect 30s. So we're very excited about that. This was supported by the Evanthea Foundation and the Four Winds, this is Diana Merriam and her family. Um, and we worked with the QuestGen CRO, I'm very happy to have done that. Um, this compares, as I said, personalized precision medicine protocol for nine months. So we didn't have to wait years. Typically this is done for years because they're looking for tiny, tiny effects. We were looking for bigger effects. So we did it for over nine months and we wanna look at all the contributors, just the ones we talked about earlier. Okay, how are we doing on time here? All right, so let's see here. Okay, so. MOCA scores we looked at. We also use CNS vital signs. And this was really helpful because it's a much more sensitive evaluation of these people. And so you can look at people even with MOCA scores 27, 28, 29, and see which ones are really doing well and which ones have already started to fail. So CNS vital signs, very, very helpful here. And then AQ21 is something that the partner fills out to say, have they had problems with this? Have they had problems with that? Have they had problems with this? Very helpful to have an idea of how many problems the spouse has noted or the study partner has noted. And then also we go back to that same thing with what's called the AQ20 because one of the questions is irrelevant there, but we wanna now look at what's improved and what's not improved. So you can get a negative score on the AQ20 if you've fallen off, you get a positive score if you've improved. So looking at all these different things, we can really get a good look. And we also do MRIs with volumetrics at the beginning and MRIs with volumetrics at the end. So we can look to see, did they improve subjectively? Did they improve objectively? Did they improve radiologically uh, over the nine months? So again, we look at insulin sensitivity, we look at mild ketosis, all the things that we have talked about. We want to treat the identified pathogens. We want to detox for those, all the things that I talked about just a few minutes ago, we addressed in this particular trial. There. Okay. And so what we found from this trial, and we're just getting set to, to send this in for publication, but I can summarize it by saying, we had unprecedented improvements in these people. In fact, we saw improvements not only in their CNS vital signs, in their MOCA scores, in their AQ20s, but also in their MRIs. So very excited to be reporting these data. And this is going to set us up now for the next trial. And I think that this will help all of us to improve the way that we evaluate and treat people who have Alzheimer's and especially to prevent it and to treat as early on as possible. So the bottom line here is that cognitive decline 
is reversible for most patients with, uh, with MCI or early uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, for those uh, whose cognition declines, one of the things that we learned from this, there were a couple of people who didn't improve. What was really interesting though, is we could see why. So there was one, as an example, <clears throat> one person who was living with high degree of mycotoxins. <clears throat> and despite all the suggestions from the physician, despite the health coach, all that said, I'm not moving, not getting rid of these, I'm not doing that. No surprise, did not improve. So I think that we can begin to see, instead of just telling people you got Alzheimer's, we have no idea why, we can begin to see for people why, who's going to improve and who's not going to improve. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for those with lower MOCA scores who really have significant Alzheimer's, we have to do a separate trial. I'm actually really enthusiastic about this because we want to see what does it take when someone has a MOCA score of five or 10 to really get improvements. What we've seen are small improvements, people going from zero to five, for example, which makes a huge subjective change in their lives, but it doesn't really get them anything close to, to back to normal. So we'd like to understand what does it take to do that? And then feasibility may be improved with simplification. One of the big issues, and uh, Dr. Kat Toops men mentioned this, I think Kat made a very good point. This is not easy. You're getting people to change their behavior. You're getting people to do things like check their, you know, their home for mold and they're looking at people doing detox. This is not easy. So what we've shown is that it's possible. We haven't shown that it's practical. And that's what we need to do. We need to do more simplification. We need to get people on earlier. No question, people, it's much easier to do this when you start early. But this does provide us wonderful support for this larger trial that I mentioned, which is gonna start uh, later this year. And I'm very excited about the possibility of now taking this general idea and being able to move it toward using this for other neurodegenerative diseases, things like Lewy body disease and vascular dementia and ALS and frontotemporal dementia, because the same general idea applies. Now, each one has its own unique biochemistry, so we would have to target to the biochemistry of each of these, but I think the possibilities are very exciting here. Then finally, combining the results of this with previous findings, that there's a decades long, as I mentioned, you have a couple of decades before you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. If you simply know that and you get started early, this really suggests that if we all do the right things, Alzheimer's disease really could be optional now instead of unavoidable. It's always been thought to be unavoidable. We can really make it now optional. Okay, so just as for leprosy and polio, Alzheimer's shall become a former scourge and we're just taking the first steps toward that. 